Well, good afternoon, boys and girls. Welcome to another scintillating, didactic, and provocative session of environment and business. Business environment, which obviously has lots of law embedded in it. Well, today we're going to take a look at the subject of consumerism, <clears throat> one of my very favorite subjects. Why is that? Well, because we're talking about legal and ethical rights uh, in terms of what the public has a right to expect from business. So when studying business and its environment, certainly uh, the legal part is uh, a minimum foundation. But, you know, the ethical uh, component is certainly higher than the minimum, right? Uh, remembering what our friend Socrates uh, already taught us, you know, ethics is about correct decision making. Uh, it's about what we ought to do. And so today we're going to dive deep and take a look at what business ought to do with respect to uh, the consuming public. So your chapter has a really uh, interesting story about Harvey Wiley, uh, <clears throat> who way back in you know 1883, you know, uh, helped establish what then uh, became known as the Bureau uh, of Chemistry, and its purpose in life was to uh, <clears throat> detect adulteration uh, in foods. Uh, what is adulteration? Uh, well. Would you believe uh, pollution, uh, impurities? And so what he found way back in 1883, surprisingly, was that there was widespread fraud and impurity in products that business sold to consumers. Hmm. So what do you think? Do consumers have a right to expect truth in advertising and pure food? Or are we still living in the time of caveat emptor, Latin phrase for let the buyer beware? Well, Mr. Wiley uh, made a good point <clears throat> way back when, arguing that, look, you know, our public uh, has a legal right <clears throat> to be protected against business exploitation and adulteration. That is the fouling or polluting uh, of food. The public has a right. Now, certainly back then in 1883, there was disagreement on this point. Well, you know, caveat emptor, it's up to the public to inspect the meat that they're purchasing or the dairy products to see that they're uh, not spoiled or polluted. That really isn't the seller's responsibility. That's the buyer's responsibility. Really? Well, back in 1883, that was, you know, the mindset. And so his research and uh, hard work uh, laid the foundation for the enactment of the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1904, which became the very first Consumer Protection Act. So <clears throat> Wiley and his uh, new gang um, became the Food and Drug Administration, responsible for enforcing this very new consumer protection law. Uh, <clears throat> and yeah, he was, uh, he was uh, a force to be reckoned with. He was strict, vigorous, uncompromising in enforcement uh, of this new law with respect to uh, business leaders. And certainly they fought back, as we're seeing today, uh, uh, with respect to that. We'll talk more about that. So <clears throat> going back to our friend, French philosopher Voltaire. So before you address me, define your terms. So what does consumerism mean? Well, we've already mentioned that it involves public expectations. And if we break that down, uh, we can find a couple of uh, meanings. First is that the consumerism is a movement. I mean, it is a movement to promote rights and the powers of consumers in relation to sellers of products and services. Uh, <clears throat> I like this 
saying of Abraham Lincoln's that the government should only do for the people what the people cannot do for themselves. So apply that to current times when there's such an emphasis on deregulation. Are we going back to the 1880s where we're in a caveat emptor situation? Or have we evolved to a point that the public, the consuming public, has a right to certain expectations with respect to products and services? And we use government regulation to enforce those because none of us can all by ourselves uh, <clears throat> force a uh, wrongdoer uh, in the corporate world to uh, rectify any uh, uh, bad behavior that they're exercising towards us. And the second you know, part of uh, consumerism involves what we simply refer to as a powerful ideology in which you know, <clears throat> the pursuit of material goods beyond subsistence shapes social conduct. Where this is where ethics comes in, right? So historically, we know that when we had the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s, <clears throat> we certainly had expansion of trade with colonial empires like our good friends, uh, the British. And, you know, new products uh, came into being and social change uh, came about. Certainly we had uh, small time uh, retailers uh, who innovated in terms of advertising and marketing, started window displays and created uh, consumer demand, push pull, right? Well, uh, religion was uh, an important force in those days. Um, Religious doctrines declined with the pursuit of material pleasures. They, over a period of time, uh, lost uh, their public uh, importance as consumerism grew, grew, and grew. And so we had the growth of individualism, certainly the uh, growth in population of cities, and the breakdown, if you will, over traditional status boundaries. Times changed, right? Times changed. And so we had this consumer ideology that uh, surfaced in the late 1800s uh, that started to <clears throat> get the public uh, attention. And of course, to every action, there is a reaction, right? Um, an aesthetic Puritan, American Puritan uh, theology uh, began to lose its prominence in our society. Um, the aestheticism, that is appreciation of the beautiful for its own sake, uh, gave way to a desire for accumulation of goods. Certainly individualism grew stronger. stronger. I want something for myself. I don't want hand-me-down shirts and pants from my brothers. Certainly international trade expanded and our own economy, you know, exploded. Certainly the railroads added to the creation of national markets. We had merger waves that uh, saw banks uh, merge one after another, creating more and more business power. And of course, we had the advent of <clears throat> new consumer products. Henry Ford's uh, automobile. I loved, uh, I still love his old saying, you know, you can have your Ford Model T in any color as long as it's black. <laughs> Watches came into being. And of course, refrigerators replaced ice boxes. I can still remember the ice boxes where the ice man had to come every week with a great big huge chunk of ice that fit in the bay in the bottom of uh, an ice box and that kept uh, the food in the ice box uh, <clears throat> cool until the ice melted and the ice man returned it guess what <laughs> he no longer coming so certainly we saw <clears throat> movement from small towns uh, to the cities certainly for increased labor opportunities and yes, traditional status distinctions loosened over time. Families 
spread out where they used to uh, live together. And so <clears throat> consumerism was a growth ideology uh, to try and carve out certain parts of our society to protect it from the consumerism wave uh, lost ground. So we used to have what are called Sunday closing laws or blue laws, which prohibited by law, uh, state law mostly, uh, businesses from being open on Sunday. And so uh, the whole idea of thrift and simple living uh, gave way to what we simply refer to as the consumerism movement. How about this interesting statistic that today the United States is 32nd in world in the world in saving. In other words, our proclivity is to buy, 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 not save, save, save. Which leads us to ask the question: why is that? Why is that that we have gone from a saving society? to a consumption society. The Japanese, for example, are a saving society. Well, <clears throat> there are arguments, right? All based on the idea that material values undermine higher values. What do you think? Is that true or false? That uh, material values undermine higher values, the aesthetic uh, appreciation of the beautiful? Uh, these allegations go something like this. Consumerism leads to the commodification of life. In other words, people are revolving around their possessions. And what they wear and how they look uh, has everything to do with status and how they're uh, appreciated uh, as human beings. Hmm, true or false? Consumption for emotional reasons encourages unwise, unproductive uses of money. Well, how about this one? Shopaholics. Do we all know shopaholics? <clears throat> he or she who shops, shops, shops till you drop? Uh, <clears throat> when you die and go to heaven? Hey, whoever has the most wins, right? <laughs> That's where that argument goes. Well, certainly consumption for emotional reasons encourages uh, unwise, unproductive uses of money. And so certainly purchases based on emotion uh, may not be a good thing. And obviously uh, there are sellers who want to prey upon that proclivity. Certainly heavy consumption wastes uh, natural resources. Uh, consuming uh, luxury items <clears throat> certainly can breed uh, gluttony and greed. Remember the greed movie? Remember the greed movie you saw earlier in the semester? So what was its message to you back then? That greed is bad? Uh, I think the argument of, the, uh, of John Stossel was that, no, it's not bad. That, you know, anything in excess is bad. Eating too much, drinking too much, working too much, too much of anything can be a bad thing. But in moderation, greed is not a bad thing. It is, in fact, a good thing because it incentivizes people to do things they might not do. How about the argument that consumerism is a pathology of corporate capitalism that leads corporations to manipulate consumers? Perhaps partially true, but totally true? I'm not so sure. And there are some virtues that are pointed out in defense of consumerism that certainly products and services are designed to fulfill consumer needs. Oh, good heavens, look at iPhones today as a good example of that. Fulfilling both needs and latent needs awakened by marketers has certainly emotional benefits. People feel a little more secure uh, when they're traveling with uh, an iPhone so that they can easily make contact when their car breaks down, which uh, they all do. There's certainly competition among wholesalers and retailers to, you know, meet the consumer's needs. 
And so, yes, we have a prolif constantly proliferating product and service choices that stimulate consumption. And yes, the iPhone's a good example. So how many editions of the iPhone have we had? And the same thing goes with flat screen TVs, and we're certainly seeing it with automobiles and autopilot uh, cars and whatnot. Happiness derived from material acquisition is as fulfilling as happiness derived from non-material pursuits and just as fulfilling. Goods versus virtue. True or false, do you think? I think there's some truth to that. Uh, but do people really have their satisfaction satiated by acquiring the good, or do they now transfer uh, that desire it's always increasing for more and more goods to some other item or good. Hence the issue of money, right? Money by, uh, by itself is neutral. It's not a, a good or a negative. It is neutral. It's what we do with money that makes a difference. And money certainly represents power. So we've certainly had a progressive uh, social movement to protect uh, consumers from fraud, deception, and greed using regulation. And so right now, we're having a national conversation. Uh, certainly Congress is, certainly the EPA and a number of governmental agencies are taking a good look at their government regulations to determine should they be revised like Dodd-Frank or Sox, should they be eliminated, or should they be left alone? These are, I think, good conversations. We have what's called a sunset uh, provision in a lot of uh, pieces of legislation that require the legislation to be reviewed for remaining in existence um, every two or three or four years. And I'm not sure that's a bad thing, requiring agencies to take a look at their regulations to, to see, one, are they updated? Uh, and two, if not, are they in need of revision? And three, if so, you know, what revisions should there be? So I think there's a lot of uh, support for revising parts of Dodd-Frank, uh, which obviously came to us in 2008 as a consequence of the too big to fail uh, experience. But the idea of completely rescinding it, canceling it, uh, I think even the banks uh, are in favor of maintaining uh, the majority of Dodd-Frank. So uh, certainly historically we saw new activism uh, surface in the 60s and 70s, and it just wasn't you know business activism. We certainly had political and religious and civil rights activism, <clears throat> and of course that brought about you know new governmental agencies: the uh, Federal Drug Administration, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Security and Exchange Commission the Federal Aeronautics Administration. Oh, help me, Mr. Lincoln. Oh, Mr. Lincoln, the government should only do for the people what the people cannot do for themselves. What do you think? So we've got consumer critics, uh, including my friend Ralph Nader, who uh, is a good consumer advocate, uh, <clears throat> who says, look, you know, when the public gets abused, as certainly the auto industry did with the uh, Corvair, in the 1960s, Ralph became famous when he wrote his uh, epic uh, book, Unsafe at Any Speed, that look, when uh, there is abuse by business of its power, there very often is going to be a reaction, as we saw with enactment of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act in 2002 and enactment of Dodd-Frank in 2008. So how about this statistic? Wow, there are more than 50 federal agencies that are active in consumer affairs. Well, and Thomas Jefferson said this too, right along with Mr. Lincoln, that the government should only do for the people what they can't do for themselves. So what are the four biggest uh, consumer protection agencies? I already mentioned our good friends at the Food and Drug Administration. Look how long ago it was created. While it has 11,500 employees, they have to enforce 42 statutes relating to food, drugs, medical devices, cosmetics, tobacco, and on it goes. Well, do we need all this regulation? Well, do you remember uh, 
Johnson and Johnson in our Tylenol arsenic case? Do you think there's a need for tamper-proof bottle tops out there? Uh, the Federal Trade Commission is another very uh, powerful agency that its purpose in life is to protect the public uh, against unfair competition. So we would agree uh, deceptive advertising uh, creates unfair competition. Have you ever been a victim of sales fraud? How about lender discrimination? Here's my favorite, one of my favorites, bait and switch. So you see advertised on television or you get in your mailbox a uh, commercial flyer that says, hey, uh, this um, um, company is selling this particular vacuum cleaner, this uh, deluxe vacuum cleaner on sale for $99.95. So you go into the store with your uh, <clears throat> advertisement wanting to buy this deluxe vacuum cleaner at uh, $99.95, only to be told by the salesperson, oh, no, you know, we just ran out of the last one. But, you know, we've got one that's just as good right here for $129.95. Yeah, $30 more, right? Bait and switch. Bait the customer to come in and then switch the product for a higher priced one. That's against the law. And it is our Federal Trade Commission that enforces that. Here's my all-time favorite, the solar dryer. I saw this on television one night. It was very late. And, you know, you get to see all these uh, late night uh, advertisers. And this one was selling a solar dryer for $50. Call this 1-800 number, give them your credit card, and we will rush you a solar dryer. So you get this box in a few days after you've uh, purchased it uh, with your credit card. And you open up the box. And what does the box contain? A clothesline. That's your solar dryer for $50, no less. So do you think you have been victimized by advertising deception? Yes, I think so. And so the Federal Trade Commission comes to your rescue to uh, uh, police that type of commercial misconduct. The Consumer Product Safety Commission created in 1972 Texas uh, from being injured by uh, consumer products, especially those that come in from overseas. We all have seen around Christmas time uh, toys that uh, come onto the market, some of which may be dangerous to uh, children. Uh, but it's only got 500 employees to try and police over well over 15,000 products. The National Highway uh, Traffic Safety Administration uh, is responsible for uh, automobile and truck safety standards. Anybody remember uh, the Ford Pinto that had the fully exploding uh, rear gas tank? Originally, when the Ford Pinto came out, it had the gas tank on the side of the car. They moved it to the rear of the car to try and uh, save money on weight. But, of course, when you get rear-ended, kaboom, right? So uh, <clears throat> Ford ended up having to pay big time for that one. Product liability is a subject that, that we all need to be sensitive to. What is product liability? Well, it's actually a legal doctrine in the, under the law of torts that is uh, personal injury that uh, involves redress for injuries that are caused by defective products like the Ford Pinto, right? Now, there are essentially three legal theories uh, in torts that involve product liability because we probably should be able to agree that business should only be permitted to sell safe products. The first theory is called negligence, that manufacturers and sellers have a legal duty to do what a reasonable, prudent person exercising ordinary care would do under similar circumstances. In other words, you can't sell an unsafe product. A reasonable person, a prudent person wouldn't do that. And if you do, there are going to be legal consequences. 
So certainly way back in the 1800s and early 1900s, uh, we didn't have this product legal liability doctrine. It has developed over time to the present uh, now where clearly there is enormous liability in the sale uh, by not just wholesalers, but retailers, everybody in the chain. So let's take, for example, a uh, uh, milk or a dairy product that is sold that happens to be spoiled. Well, who is negligent under the circumstances? The manufacturer is negligent uh, and is liable. The wholesaler is negligent and is liable. And the retailer is negligent and uh, liable. The principle of caveat emptor, meaning let the buyer beware, <clears throat> clearly was the legal standard, if you will, until uh, uh, the mid and uh, late uh, 1900s. And so that no longer exists as a legal principle. It used to be that uh, uh, only people who actually purchased the item and were injured by it were in privity of contract. That is, that purchased it in a contractual situation from a seller could hold the seller liable for product liability uh, injuries. No longer true, no longer true. So guests, if you will, who are riding your automobile, who are injured because of there's a defect in the automobile, can receive the same recovery as the buyer. And so, yeah, that's true. Uh, we have evolved into a uh, consumer society uh, and consumers, and. The milestone McPherson versus Buick case is a good example where, you know, consumers can sue manufacturers for, that are negligent in the uh, production or design of the product. Why is that? What's a warranty? Well, a warranty is a product. It is fundamentally a promise, right? It is fundamentally a promise a seller makes to you the buyer, this is a, a legal promise, in which the seller guarantees the nature of the product, that it will pass as normal and similar goods would in the trade. If the product doesn't conform to the standards in the warranty, then the buyer is entitled to compensation for any loss or injury. Now, there are two types of warranties, clearly an express warranty, is an explicit claim by the manufacturer to the buyer that the product will perform in a certain way. So for example, lots of automobiles, new ones, when we buy them, come with warranties that say this automobile will uh, travel 100,000 miles without major maintenance, okay? Well, that's an express warranty. Certainly anything that is expressly uh, in your, contained in a warranty guide, your contract, or even um, expressly made to you by the salesperson, provided there is not a subsequent contradiction in the sales contract, um, are express warranties that will hold the manufacturer uh, liable for breach thereof. Now we also have what's called the implied warranty. What's an implied warranty? All sellers are required to make implied warranties regarding new products. What are the warranties that they're required to make? That the product will fulfill its ordinary purpose and the particular purpose of the buyer. So we would say, for example, a carton of milk should not be spoiled, right? And should pass as similar cartons of milk would in the tray. If it doesn't because it's spoiled, aha, we have a breach of the implied warranty. Strict liability. There are some products that are inherently dangerous. So let's take, for example, automobiles. We can all agree, boys and girls, that automobiles are inherently dangerous. Certainly weapons, uh, hunting uh, rifles and whatnot, we would agree are inherently uh, dangerous, right? Toxic chemicals. 
are inherently dangerous, right? So there are lots of products that are, that are inherently dangerous that the law requires uh, uh, strict liability. What is strict liability? The doctrine of strict liability here is that under the doctrine, manufacturers and sellers can be held liable without any showing of negligence, that is the failure to use due care. So let's take, for example, a toxic chemical plant. There is a lightning strike that sets the toxic chemical plant on fire and it burns down the nearby city. Question, is the toxic chemical plant liable for the damages to the nearby city? Answer, under the doctrine of strict liability, yes. If you own it, <laughs> you are responsible for it, uh, for good or for bad. And hence, let's take, for example, the Ford Pinto. I mentioned that earlier. Certainly the Tesla autopilot cars have caused uh, Tesla to put in their sales contracts, for those that are purchasing, that the buyer... Uh, agrees that the uh, car, when it is on autopilot, the uh, buyer must remain in the driver's seat and able to retake control of the car uh, when necessary. Uh, this, to some extent, relieves Tesla of legal liability under the strict liability doctrine, uh, unless, of course, there's some type of defect in the program. But again, they try and protect themselves against strict liability by saying, look, the buyer has a uh, safety obligation to remain in the driver's seat and uh, so they can retake control of the car should anything happen. So clearly going into the back seat to play with your children would violate that uh, principle. Well, we had in our chapter for today, an interesting uh, discussion of uh, alcohol advertising. Wow! Well, how about this? Over 10% of Americans want to ban alcohol. And we used to have in the Constitution an amendment called the Prohibition uh, Amendment. But that's only 10%. There are 90% of us out there that do enjoy imbibing from time, time to time. But like anything else that we consume, everything in moderation, nothing in excess, right? So certainly there has been a lot of criticism about alcohol advertising because uh, product uh, sellers try and use uh, brand image advertising. <clears throat> but, you know, uh, critics find this manipulative, misleading, and irresponsible when you see... Uh, Corona beer, you know, commercials. Um, certainly uh, image ads can inflame industry's uh, adversaries. Uh, uh, but, you know, I'm not so sure, you know, well, we call it commercial speech in that sellers have a legitimate right to engage in commercial speech, i.e. advertising, as long as, as it is truthful, okay? As long as it is truthful. There is no legal right to falsely represent or lie to the public, as we're going to see regarding uh, the sale of a product. So we had the case of uh, the spikes and wide eye bad products. Uh, did you think uh, they were being marketed in a um, objectionable or misleading way? Do you think companies should be allowed to market uh, caffeinated alcoholic beverages? Clearly, that's going to wire you big time, right? Do you think that might affect the driver of an automobile, especially at a high speed when you combine both alcohol and uh, caffeine? Well, and so we uh, had uh, the government uh, get involved to here, and uh, there were certainly... Uh, uh, safety arguments that were made uh, about the caffeine together with the alcohol being a very red flag because the stimulant action was said to mask impairment, especially for inexperienced uh, drinkers. 
So the FDA got involved here and uh, really put the manufacturers in a uh, interesting spot, asking them to explain why caffeine was a safe ingredient in their products. Guess what they all did? They dropped the caffeine out of their, uh, their products. They had a hard time explaining that, right? So clearly, you know, uh, marketers zero in uh, on youthful drinkers, and that can be uh, certainly a societal, you know, problem. How about this? Do alcoholic beverage companies fulfill their ethical duty to be informative and truthful in advertising? What do you think? <clears throat> the, of course, the truth about the consumption of alcohol is that there are a lot of variables. Your height, your weight, certainly your age, whether or not you've had anything to uh, eat, uh, all bears upon your ability uh, to assimilate uh, uh, alcohol and have it affect your uh, physical behavior. So <clears throat> the industry, of course, wants to advertise uh, the sale of alcoholic products with minimal regulation by the government. But of course, you know, while there is commercial speech uh, rights um, in the First Amendment for business, um, in fact, the industry does receive protection for its advertising claims. And so we're back to, is there anything false or deceptive in the alcohol industry's, you know, claims? <clears throat> Certainly, in our ethical doctrines that we have previously examined, rights and duties, doing what we ought to be done, are linked, right? So... <clears throat> Certainly, advertisers who exercise their commercial speech rights have a corresponding duty to make an ethical sales pitch. At a minimum, they have these ethical duties, right? Everything in moderation, nothing in excess. So what are those ethical duties? <clears throat> Certainly the duty to tell the truth and make honest claims. We could probably agree on that. To accept responsibility for the consequences of their ads. Yep. The duty to work for a positive societal impact and to avoid doing harm. Ads that shouldn't undermine societal values. And of course, the duty to respect and preserve the free will of consumers in buying decisions so that they're making informed decisions. And of course, there is the issue of underage drinkers. <clears throat> As a societal norm, we can probably agree focusing on selling alcoholic uh, beverages to those under the legal drinking age, we probably can agree is unethical. Are some of these alcoholic ads um, misleading? Well, what's misleading, you know, about them? You know, some of them may represent, you know, cool, you know, emotional, non-logical appeals like uh, uh, Corona beer has. <clears throat> But, you know, that's not dishonest. It's just a marketing ploy, right? But how about if you, you know, uh, had advertisements that really zeroed in on underage drinkers, showing age, you know, drinkers, you know, drinking, I think we could probably all agree crosses the line. Uh, and so there are lots of examples uh, of this. Where's Where's the line? Where's the line? What would a... You know, what a company ought to do under the circumstances. So these are all some of the reasons why alcohol ads may be thought <clears throat> to be misleading. What do you think? I love this one. You know, ads with subliminal appeals such as phallic symbols or mysterious pictures drawn in ice cubes like Viagra. <clears throat> Do you think there ought to be more restrictions on alcohol advertising? There are quite a few right now. How about the cigarette industry? Wow, the restrictions. Do you remember the last time you saw a cigarette commercial on television or on the radio? <laughs> you can't remember that, right? Why? Because they're banned.
So if the government has restrictions, and we would agree uh, tobacco and alcohol restrictions regarding uh, minors, uh, involves and advances a government interest that certainly for health and safety reasons, uh, the government is going to place restrictive ads, restrictions on the ads in certain media places and times. And with respect to cigarettes, wow, it's hard to find <clears throat> any advertising of uh, tobacco products today. So our Supreme Court is skeptical about ad restrictions, and so the government, the burden is on the government to demonstrate that its <clears throat> proposed regulation or restriction uh, is going to solve some social problem such as excessive drinking or um, exhaust other remedies before you know it tries uh, censorship but has been very effective with respect to tobacco products for sure well these are the <clears throat> issues that I wanted to share with you today regarding consumerism uh, it is in fact uh, I think very much a uh, ideology uh, a government as well as public ideology that sellers of products and we're talking not just manufacturers but wholesalers and retailers uh, as well uh, ought to be responsible for producing only safe products uh, nobody has a legal right to injure the public and if so there are consequences so <clears throat> I like to close with my six P's Previous planning prevents pitifully poor performance. Six P's. So when you're in manufacturing, wholesaling, or retailing, the six P's, you got to be always thinking ahead about the six P's and only selling safe products to the public. With that, boys and girls, I always invite your emails. Uh, shoot, move, communicate. Let's stay in the loop. Stay well. See you next week. Bye-bye now.